everyone and welcome to our panel. My name is Malu Grasha, NX Unite team member at Nexus Marketing and your moderator for today's panel session. Today's panel topic is data driven, harnessing the power of data in nonprofit decision making. As usual, before I introduce today's panelists and we jump into this fascinating topic, I have some quick logistics to cover. NX Unite is made in partnership with Nexus Marketing and serves as a powerful community resource designed to foster connections and facilitate lasting relationships within the mission-driven sector. On NX Unite, you can find upcoming industry events, suggested influencers to follow, trusted solutions, and cost-driven podcasts. NX Unite also provides webinars, demos, and of course, panels with experts such as these lovely folks with me here today. Today's hour-long panel will include time both for questions curated by my team and questions from you all, our fantastic audience. At any time during the panel, please feel free to submit your questions via the questions tab, or you can drop them in the chat if you want. We will spend the second half of the panel addressing as many as we possibly can. Now, if you have any technical, if you have any technical difficulties or have any logistics questions, my team member Anton is in the chat under the Team NX Unite username, ready to assist you the best he can. I also wanted to share that this panel is being recorded, so for those of you watching live, the 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 recording will be sent to your email after the session ends. People can continue to register and access the recording after the panel. So if you have any friends in the industry you want to share the insights from this panel with, simply send them that same registration page and you will be able to access the recording. All right, finally, before I introduce today's panelists, I want to thank you all for attending this panel. We are very excited to be in touch with you, the mission-driven community. Thank you for taking time to be with us today to learn from these outstanding experts who I will now finally introduce. I'd like to first introduce Brian Lacey, who is the data consultant at NPO Info and is the principal of Brian Lacey and Associates, a fundraising and data services firm with more than 30 years of experience that provides leading industry resources and veteran talent to maximize opportunities across the giving spectrum. From annual giving solutions to major and principal giving strategies, they have helped more than 400 nonprofits raise more than $1 billion in philanthropic support. Great to have you, Brian. Thanks, Colleen. Welcome, everybody. Also with us is Jennifer Bingham, who is the VP of Operations at Memory Fox, a tech startup revolutionizing the way nonprofits collect and share stories of impact within with their community. Before coming to Memory Fox, Jennifer spent over five years in the nonprofit sector where she helped build and launch tech, a tech platform to, con to, to connect military and veteran families to life-changing resources. During this time, she also gained hands-on fundraising experience, drafting and promoting peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, coordinating live and silent auction events, and overseeing external communication and marketing efforts. As a result, Jennifer is passionate about the importance of data and how, if harnessed correctly, can drive successful and powerful outcomes for nonprofits. Great to have you, Jennifer. Likewise. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Also with us today is Stephanie King, who is the Senior Salesforce Consultant at Red Path Consulting Group. She bridges the gap between the tech nerds and the rest of us. She has spent a decade working as a Salesforce Consultant, helping nonprofits leverage cloud technology to support their mission. Stephanie is a seven-time certified Senior Salesforce Consultant on the nonprofit practice team at Red Path Consulting Group. Thanks for joining us, Stephanie. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. 
And finally with us is Tim Kroll, who is a consultant for data analytics at JGA Associates. He leverages his background in finance and accounting along with, his, with experience in quantitative analysis, benchmarking and staffing and analytics to assist JGA clients in putting their data to use for better fundraising outcomes. Tim ensures consistency and security in JGA's data operations, including equity, development, audits, wealth screening, benchmarking, and feasibility studies. Great to have you, Tim. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for joining. All right, now it's finally time to hear from our panelists. And Brian, I'll have you start us off with the first question. How can nonprofits effectively utilize data to inform to inform their decision-making processes and enhance their overall operations. Oh, I think you're muted, Brian. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of points, and I'll be quick because I know that we've got we've got a great panel that'll probably go into some of these uh, in more detail than I will, but. Uh, I think it's important, first of all, that we define clear objectives whenever we're working a project. Um, data is not helpful to us if we don't know where we want to go. Uh, so again, we need to define clear objectives. We need to collect the relevant data that allows us to discuss that issue, to think about that issue. Uh, that sometimes involves creating and implementing new systems of data collection so that we're collecting data accurately and then retaining that data. Uh, data data cleansing, data validation, making sure you keep that data current. Finally, data analysis, starting to understand the data. But again, you have to collect it correctly, you have to keep it current, and then trying to understand that data, looking for patterns and trends. Finally, uh, making decisions based on the data, based on your analysis, based on your identification of patterns and trends. And then you have to regularly monitor and evaluate yourself. The one thing I've seen happen so many times is I've spoken with hundreds of nonprofits, literally hundreds of nonprofits who say, we've been doing this for years. And that's just given as an answer to supposed to close the book on something. And I'm thinking, but so many things have changed. You're doing things the way you did them 10 years ago. It's not good enough anymore. And there's so much more data available today that you may not even be using the most important data. So I'll, uh, there's a few other things that I would talk about with regards to you know, data privacy and ethics and feedback loops, but I'll just stop there and say that that's where I think we need to begin the conversation. Thank you so much for starting us off, Brian. Stephanie, I'm gonna bring the same question over to you. How can nonprofits effectively use data to make better decisions and improve their operations? I was starting in my head exactly where Brian started, which is to say that by itself, data doesn't do anything. It doesn't determine your success. It doesn't achieve your success for you. Um, that success starts by defining what success means and, and what your strategy is to achieve it. Uh, so whether we're talking about fundraising or programming, having clear measurable definitions of success. And once you have that, then data can support your work on both a macro and micro level. And I just want to think about that, those two different levels for a second, um, that on a macro level, understanding, um, you know, using data to understand if you're on track to meet your goals, and, and then having the foresight to be able to pivot when you need to before it's a crisis. And then on the micro level, having good data that can drive daily decisions about what you need to do in a day's work to, to be effective in your role. Wonderful, thanks, Stephanie. All right, Jennifer, over to you. How can nonprofits effectively use data to make better decision and improve operations? Yeah, definitely. I mean, to echo what Brian and Stephanie said, like I have to agree, you have to set those goals first to try to figure out what kind of metrics do we even wanna look at in order to establish that success and show that story to our community, whether it's our fundraiser, our funders, or our volunteers, or even our program participants. One thing, though, that um, from a boots on the ground perspective at, of being at a nonprofit, I do know that resources can be very scarce. And then time is also something that just seems to fly by. So definitely making sure that, because as Brian said, there's tons of different data out there that you can collect. So making sure that you're really focusing in 
on the ones that are going to showcase that success the best for you. But also you want to have a realistic idea of what can you collect. I mean, we I worked at an organization where we use Salesforce. And so that was really helpful in having us track certain kinds of data very easily. But definitely you want to take a hard look at the systems that you have in place to really make sure that you're able to consistently collect that data. So that way the insights you collect are, are valid. Absolutely. Thanks, Jennifer. Tim, anything you want to add to this conversation and how to effectively use data for decision making and improve operations? I mean, overall, I would, I would agree with everything that's been said thus far. Obviously, it's it's for starters, you have to know what you're trying to, to collect as far as data goes and, and what is your end result at the end of the day. Um, we, I, I work with a lot of our clients that are, are looking at their donor database to try and figure out who to who to go have conversations with. And one of the qu first questions I always ask them is, what kind of data are you collecting as far as engagement? Are people coming to events? Are they, what what's, what makes somebody that you wanna have a conversation with on the fundraising side, somebody that's raising their hand saying, I really care about the organization. That's usually the first part of the, the, the question that they go, well, I don't even know what we, sh what we actually track. So making sure that you you do uh, try and track those that information and make sure it's all in a central location too, because we have problems on that as well. And that doesn't go just for, for fundraising information. That goes for all of your data, making sure it's easily accessible and that you can regurgitate it out to whoever you need to get it out to as well. Thanks, Tim. All right, we're off to a great start. And Jennifer, I'll have you start us off with the next question. What strategies have proven successful for nonprofits in harnessing the power of data to drive both programmatic effectiveness and fundraising efforts? Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the biggest strategies that I've always found pretty big success with is looking at the impact per dollar um, within your organization. That can go a long ways, both on the programmatic side and the fundraising side. And so I definitely recommend like looking at that strategy and trying as best as you can to pull out per $1 that is donated to your organization figuring out the impact and all those data points that it actually leads to. Because you can then go ahead and use this in grant applications, um, in towards your fundraising community in newsletters and social media and things like that. Um, so that's one of the key strategies that I would recommend. Another one that I absolutely love, because I think nonprofits are perfect for this, is A, B, even C testing. Um, at Memory Fox, we offer a really great option for organizations to test out different campaigns targeted at different sectors of their community. So you can really take a deep dive to learn what works when talking to volunteers, when talking to donors, and then when talking to program participants. So definitely, you know, make sure you're A-B testing and then tracking those results. I think that's one of the biggest strategies you can find to figure out what works. I love that. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, Tim, over to you. What successful strategies should nonprofits use in harnessing the power of data for better programs and fundraising? First off, on the fundraising side, I think one of the things that I have run into a number of times with, especially smaller not-for-profits, is they don't necessarily look at the, they don't do a wealth screening of their database, of their donor database to see who has who has funds even available to go have conversations with. Um, so making sure you're doing that every three to five years, some, something along those lines. But it's easy to get bogged down once you receive that information. You, you get this huge database back with all this information. You look at it and say, okay, there's a donor that has all this money that they have, they have tremendous wealth capacity. Well, oftentimes that may be somebody who a friend asked to give one time, they've given one donation. And so they're on your list, but you don't really have a true um, relationship with them. So trying to look at, are they engaged with the organization as well? And, and we have a product that JJ that kind of can help do that, but it doesn't need to be us. It's just look and make sure that are they attending events? Are they doing, are they opening emails? If they, if you're sending out emails, all that kind of things, anything you can track from a data side. And then we're on the, uh, the programmatic side. We've helped some of our clients to, uh, to look at not just how are their programs doing currently and, and are they helping their constituents, but also looking externally to see, to do some, um, uh, uh, geofencing to say, okay, the people that are not, that could be served by us, but are not currently be, are being served. What are they, are they not hearing about us? Are they, do they think the programs are not what they need? Is there something else that's needed to really kind of help enhance what the programs could be in the future as well is, is something else that, that I think is, is very important to, to make sure you're not just looking at what is happening internally, but also externally. 
Great. Thanks, Tim. All right, Brian, same question over to you. What successful strategies should nonprofits use for better programs and fundraising? Sorry, Colleen. Thanks uh, very much. Um, I like what I heard already, you know, A-B testing, measuring outcomes, prospect research. Um, I would add to that um, donor behavior analysis. You know, we know um, we know what we're told. You know, many times any of us who've sat in on a board meeting uh, has probably heard a board member say, I don't understand why we send so many letters. If you just sent a letter every December, everybody would give and you'd have your money. That's in fact, what the donors tell us, it's not in fact what they do. So a little bit of donor behavior analysis as well on top of our prospect research, um, and you can bear it out almost certainly with A-B testing um, is important. I would say one of the old tried, tested, and true old ideas, but it's still absolutely relevant, is segmentation and personalization. I continue to get mail that is not personalized, and I don't understand why in 2023 I'm getting a dear friend letter, um, especially when I look at the letter carefully enough and I'm in the industry so I can tell that they laser printed the letter because they've personalized some elements of the letter, but they haven't bothered to call me out or address me by name. So, uh, so I would add segmentation and personalization, donor behavior analysis, and one other one I, I won't, I'll just mention it because I bet that uh, Stephanie's going to talk about it, and that is data-driven storytelling. Um, if we have the data, we need to be doing our storytelling based on the data. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, Stephanie, what would you like to add? What are some strategies nonprofits should use in harnessing the power of data? Yeah, so I'm going to bring up one of my favorite things. Um, at Red Path, where I work and with my clients, I am known for my love of data dashboards. So a dashboard, if you're not familiar with it, um, is, is really just what it sounds like. It's like the dashboard of your car, a collection of gauges and metrics that's pulling live data from your system about the status of everything, right? How fast are we going? How much gas is in the tank? Are we too hot? Is anything on fire? With a typical client, I will work with them to develop dashboards in three areas. Uh, two of these areas were mentioned in the question, program-related dashboards and fundraising dashboards. Uh, the third type of dashboard helps make sure that the first two are as useful as possible. This dashboard is what I like to call a data quality dashboard. And there's been some mention of this concept uh, as, as folks have been talking. So in all of these categories, um, uh, especially the first two, uh, we often have different dashboards aimed at different levels of interaction. So back to uh, the concept that I talked about the first time around about the uh, concept of macro versus micro level views. Uh, so from a macro perspective, you want to see overall results. How much money have we raised? Which campaigns were most effective? How do these results compare to last year? Uh, or on the programming side, how many people have we served? What demographics are represented? What are the outcomes of our work? These dashboards are the money shot that you take with you to the next board meeting, or you throw in the monthly newsletter or the annual report. Um, if your dashboard is connected to live data in your system, it no longer takes weeks to compile and visualize your results. Um, I've heard amazing stories about the time and the manpower that is sometimes invested in just pulling together what I think should just be at your fingertips every day, uh, ideally. Um, so instead of having that available at the click of a button and all on one page, um, that's the vision for that macro level dashboard. And then on the micro dashboard, micro level, um, you should have dashboards that drive daily decisions. Uh, so who are your major donors who have not received a personal touch yet this year, let's say? Or how many open cases do you have on the service side? Who needs to get a call today? Uh, where are all your grant applications at in the pipeline and what due dates are coming up this month? Uh, the details about what this what this micro level dashboard looks like are super specific and personal to what, you know, to your business, right? Um, but that, that concept of that dashboard is one of the best tools available to both empower those individual contributors uh, and to enable good oversight, insight, continuity from, from a management perspective. And then really quick, that last type of dashboard that I mentioned is the data quality dashboard. Um, all these other dashboards are only as good as the data behind them. So it's important to put some thought into how you manage and control data quality issues. Um, duplicate contacts, incomplete records, common data entry mistakes, however those tend to happen in your system, uh, those all 
very quickly impact the usefulness of your data. So um, a dashboard can also be used um, as, uh, as a way to keep an eye on those common issues and, and both prevent them and treat them. Dashboards. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. All right, very quickly, I'd like to remind our live audience to start submitting those questions at any time so we can address the topics that are relevant to you and your team. All right, here's our next question. And Tim, I'll have you start us off with this one. Can you share insights on the different ways nonprofit can leverage data across various aspects of their organization from program planning to donor engagement? I will do more, most of the mine, most of my answer will be around the donor engagement side, just because that's where I, my focus really is at, at JGA. Um, but realistically, I just actually came from a conference um, here in Indianapolis and we had a long discussion about AI and how it can actually potentially help with, with data and those things moving forward. We, we've, uh, we've got a great partner that we work with that is currently they do a lot of well screening, but they've added a lot of AI touches to it as well. They, they'll they look back at the last five years, all of your transactions, and they can actually tell you who's an emerging person that in the next year is going to give 10% more than they've ever given in their lifetime, or who's a person that in their lifetime is going to, they're not currently there, but they'll potentially be in the top 10% of donors in, the, in their in eventually down the road, those kind of things. Or, and there's also traditionally the, when you look at donor screening, a lot of the a lot of uh, donor screen companies look at an RFM score, recency, frequency, and how much money somebody's given you. And two people can look identical by that score, but can be be completely different donors. They can give ten thousand dollars over the last five years, and the last gift was last December. But one is giving you every year they've given you do donations. The other one is giving that in the last five months of the last year. Those are two drastically different people. But that RFM score, the traditional one, looks at them completely the same. Well, look, using that data over looking at the last five years, all the transactions, it'll separate those people out so that, you know, let's have a conversation with that person now that is having that has been giving more of those gifts recently. Something may have happened in their life that now they can give the donations or they've just recently discovered your organization and really care about it. There could be a lot of different reasons for it, but um, utilizing the data that you already have in your system to try and find those individuals that you can get. Um, that those fundraising dollars to really support your organization to really improve what you're doing in your in your organization is one of the top things that that we really see at JGA. Thanks, Tim. All right, Jennifer, on to you. Any insights and in how nonprofits can use data in different areas areas like pro program planning and donor engagement? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, in regards to specifically with fundraising, you know, we look at all of the different avenues that we can take from a fundraising perspective. And really the data is going to show you where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And that's one of the like key things that I recommend everybody doing before they like start their fundraising event is look at the historical data that you've collected from the past years or from past similar events to make sure that you are targeting the people that you want to, that you're putting your time and your energy into those events that are going to be those like tent pole fundraisings for fundraising events for you. But particularly on the programmatic side, I think sometimes we get a little bit lost in the data because um, I, I hate to say this, but I feel like in, in nonprofit, we have a tendency to really rely on anecdotal evidence, which is helpful. It's part of the story, but really taking a look at those programmatic numbers and doing deep dives um, wherever you can. So for instance, when I worked at a nonprofit and we were developing uh, this software platform for veterans and military families, we had a lot of assumptions that actually were not validated by the data. And it ultimately changed the entire course of the way that that platform was built and like pushed out to the community. So definitely taking a deep dive on the data side programmatically, I think creates very strong programs that you know uh, your community that you're trying to impact will actually appreciate. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, Stephanie, over to you. What would you like to add to this conversation and how nonprofits can use data in different areas um, like program planning and donor engagement? I just want to say that I loved Jennifer's uh, concept there of challenging those assumptions with your data and being, you know, asking those questions of your data and and seeing that how how your strategy can 
change. What you're doing can change based on what you see in the data. Um, I love seeing users rallied around a database um, together and understanding how to use it in their daily work. There are really a simple examples of how this works. Um, for example, using your data to send timely thank yous to your donors or reaching, reaching out to big donors who are due for annual renewals. These are the simple things that you would think are just a given except I've seen that they're not <laughs> always, that that people, if you haven't figured out how to use your data, these really obvious wins can, um, can float away down the river. Uh, data allows organizations to spend their money strategically. For example, sending gala fundraiser invitations to your whole contact list uh, might be prohibitively costly and not very effective if some of the people on that list have never donated or haven't been in touch in years. Uh, so using data effectively means sending that invitation to a curated list of engaged donors who are most likely to attend and participate. Uh, using services like wealth screening, we've heard uh, about that from Tim, and I'll just back that up. Um, using wealth screening can be used to um, enhance your data beyond what you're ever going to be able to collect organically. Uh, you might discover that someone who has been a passive participant so far actually has deep top pockets and an inclination to donate in your sector. That's very useful data. <laughs> um, zooming out a little bit, I have seen organizations pivot their whole strategy, as it sounds like Jennifer has, um, based on what that data reveals. Um, for example, without seeing aggregated data, it could be easy to miss that there's a massive trend in how your constituents like to engage with you. Uh, maybe people used to attend in-person events, and now your online offerings are getting way more attention. Your program delivery people with their feet on the ground probably have certain, you know, hunches and insights that this is happening. Uh, but when you actually put together those numbers in a way that really shows it, you might make that strategic shift in how you're delivering services and do it much sooner than you would have done without having that, that visual insight to your data. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, Brian, we want to hear from you as well. What are the different type, different ways nonprofits can leverage data? Thank you. Um, we heard about program planning. We heard about that from Jennifer and, and Stephanie. Um, we also heard uh, about resource allocation from Stephanie. Fundraising, all three of the other panelists have talked about fundraising. I would agree absolutely with all of them on all those things. I'm going to add uh, three more very quickly. Marketing and outreach. We now have more social media data available to us than at any time, and yet most of us aren't looking at it. I mean, People are telling us through their social media profiles what they care about, what they're interested in, and so forth. We can lean into all of that data. And they're telling us where they like to communicate as well. So we can lean into those opportunities. So it's, a, it's another, uh, another place where you can use data, certainly, is marketing and outreach. Um, volunteer management. So many of our organizations continue to use volunteers. Um, sometimes the volunteers are used to affect uh, program uh, goals, but also that volunteer opportunity, those volunteers that we that we cultivate and 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 encourage, um, we're getting them to more deeply invest in our organization. It's very, very unlikely that if somebody volunteers with your organization over a couple of years that they won't become a very significant donor over over time. You know, um, it used to be in the old days, we used to talk about the three eyes: interest, invest, or interest, involve, invest. You first get their interest. You then involve them in your work as a volunteer, and then you'll find that they start investing in you. So I would, my second one, my or my additional one is volunteer management. Last one I'd say is collaborations and partnerships. Those wealth screenings that they've all talked about. Um, one of the beauties of those things is we discover, oh my lord, we've got this person who owns this business in this sector, or we've got this person who's a serious SEC insider at a serious, you know, at a large company. We have these people who have these connections and these relationships. And we can build collaborations and partnerships from that data. So using data, we know where to go. We don't have to guess at, oh golly, how the heck, how the heck are we gonna get this, this thing to work better? We have people who care about our organizations. We have information that tells us where they might be able to leverage their relationships on our behalf. We just need to lean into that data and it's available to us. Thanks, Brian. All right, Stephanie, here's our next question. In your view, what role does data play in helping nonprofits build a holistic understanding of their impact internally and externally, and how can this inform future strategies? 
Right. So I think a lot of people get into nonprofit work because of big feelings and a desire to do good um, in the course of our work. And those big feelings come from lived experiences and your gut instincts about, about what you have as an organization and what the world needs. Um, and those gut instincts uh, about things do tell us a lot, but it's hard to sell gut instincts to a donor who might not have seen what you have seen in your life or uh, what you see in the day-to-day -day of your work and the impact that you are having. So data allows you to tell your story uh, about your impact in a way that is both verifiable and compelling. So when you say you're having a big impact, you can demonstrate what that means with numbers uh, in addition to testimonials and anecdotal evidence and, and really together those make the full package. Um, when you say you wanna double your impact, you can plan for exactly what that's going to mean and ask for what you are gonna need to get there and measure your progress toward that goal and data helps you do all those things. Thanks, Stephanie. Returning to Brian, how does data help nonprofits understand their impact both internally and externally? Thanks. Um, I'm going to give sort of an example. So I, I would say there, I, I break it into three areas. I'd say there's internal insights, there's external insights, and then I'll put the strategic and planning and, and future strategies in, into a third area. Um, one of the things we learned, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough now and I've been in development so long, uh, about 35 years, and I worked, I've worked with universities my entire career. I work with lots of other nonprofits now as well. But, you know, I'm old enough that when we started in the nonprofit world, the annual fund meant two things. One, you spent the money annually, but you only asked for one gift a year. Okay. Um, I have annual giving consulting clients that I am persuading to seek three gifts a year from their donors. What we learned uh, over the years in annual giving is that those people who care about us, they'll give us two, three, four gifts a year. Okay. Um, uh, what they're saying is what we kind of learn is at times is they establish for them the amount they're comfortable giving. So, you know, we have to nuance that and massage them and we can move them slowly up. But somebody who's giving $100 um, is, is just as likely to give you $100 three times a year if you ask them at the right time or if you ask them frequently enough and with a case that's persuasive enough. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things we've learned. I would call that an internal insight. We learned that by looking at the behavior. When we asked for second gifts, we got second gifts far more frequently than we got donor gifts from non-donors. So it became, golly, it makes a lot more sense to ask the donors three times a year than before we ask any non-donors for even one gift. We will do better on the third appeal to non to the previous donors than we will on the first appeal to the non donors. You know, so that I would call that an internal ins insight. The out the external insight is, you know, we're we're going to learn, um, you know, from our board who don't live and breathe us every day. They're living in the world, they're working in the world, and they have assessments. They make mental assessments of us and our ability to serve the community based on what they see. So I think listen to those people. Um, they're not always correct, but certainly their perception is important to us because it's telling us how we're perceived in the community. So we should be listening to that kind of information. And then going forward uh, with respect to strategic planning or future strategies, I would say that we have to think about long-term sustainability uh, of our ideas and our concepts. And we also have to think of innovation because obviously things have changed and what the tools available to us are very different today than they were even five or 10 years ago. So, you know, informed decision-making with iterative improvement where we keep looking, looking, looking. Um, I hope that I, you know, again, I still hear it occasionally when I go to clients who say we've always done it that way. Um, I hope that we hear that less and less and that people are more and more open to new ideas. I don't, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The stuff that works, a lot of the stuff that worked before still works. Um, so um, I encourage people to consider those things. But I would say that's how I, some of the things I've noticed over 35 years in the business. That's wonderful. Thanks, Brian. All right, Tim, anything to add on how data can help in understanding impact internally and externally and how this shapes future plans? Sure. Um, everything that's been said is fantastic already, um, but I would add just a couple things to it. Um, we've we've helped some of our clients, as I kind of alluded to earlier, to to really look not just internally as far as getting 
one thing I, I we definitely recommend doing is doing surveys of the people that you're you're giving services to, or you know, if it's a university to the students and to the parents and those kind of things. But also looking externally and, and finding out some survey information from them too, as far as what do they what do they look for that they're not receiving currently that might be housed underneath your organization or it could be because. Um, Lots of organizations are very good at certain things, but if they make small tweaks, very small ones, they can help out more people as well. Um, and the best way to find that out we've seen is through survey work and that kind of thing. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of piggyback a little bit on what Brian said just a bit ago as far as the boards go. Um, we've seen a lot of boards also uh, when they're looking at the fundraising side of things say, you know, you're staffed up well enough in the development side you're good. You don't need any any other resources or they don't want to give other extra resources to that side. If you do a little bit of ROI analysis, looking at what you actually have in your donor database and who potentially those those people that are potential to go out and have good conversations with, um, if it's more than what you can currently get to in visits, do a little ROI analysis. See how much in the next five years they a new person might come in, what you're paying them, what what they uh, would potentially get in return, and a lot of times once you bring that to the board, it'll get them to say, okay, that is, that's an investment that we need to make. But we see it a lot of times where, where development staff is saying, we need more, we need more. We don't have enough people to really get out and see the right individuals. Um, and that's the best way we've seen to do it is to really look at what you already have. You have the, hopefully you have the data from wealth screening or, or that, that kind of information. And you already know what you're going to pay people and kind of, but remember to look at benefits as well. That's one thing I always want to say, because a lot of people forget that they just look at the salary, make sure you're encompassing everything and do an ROI analysis over the next five years. The first year might be slow. They have to do a lot of cultivation that first year, but as they go out further, those individuals, they can bring in a decent amount of money and cover those costs as well. Thanks, Tim. All right, Jennifer, what would you like to add in how data can help nonprofits understand their impact and how this shapes future plans? So I definitely want to echo a lot of what Stephanie said, because I think that that is so true. I've seen it happen um, both from inside and outside a nonprofit where um, it, they seem to kind of separate anecdotal and testimonial evidence and actual hard data um, as if they're like mutually exclusive. And that's not the case. It's really, they really, really, really do go hand in hand. And I think by understanding that and looking at it from both sides, I think that that allows both a nonprofit from in the internal perspective and external perspective in terms of like messaging, but also like connection to the mission, really appreciate the impact that they're having on the community. And that just creates, you know, like a better sense of worth. Like I understand what I'm doing here and it, it helps like kind of raise morale in a nonprofit, but specifically talking about informing future strategies in particular, I think we see the marriage of both of these as being truly important to inform strategies in regards to grant funding, because really grantors want to see both. And I think sometimes we can get caught up in that, uh, oh, we have this really great testimonial evidence that we want to put into this grant. But if you're not putting up those numbers, the likelihood that you're going to even get the grant, or even if you do get it, sustain the grant so that way they can become a multi-year funder start to slowly and slowly decrease we've seen that all the time and so i definitely recommend wherever possible to try to pull out both the like hard quantitative data and and also the qualitative data of like the impact boots on the ground impact that your organization is having um, it's so so crucial especially when it comes to grant making Absolutely. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. This is the last of my questions before opening it up to our wonderful audience. But before I open that door, I want to sneak in my next question. And Tim, I'm going to have you start us off with this one. What are some key considerations for nonprofits aiming to foster a culture of data-driven decision-making and continuous improvement, regardless of their specific focus within the organization? I think a lot of this goes back to kind of what's been said a number of times here is making sure you have the right data up front. And, and it's the data that goes to what you're trying to aim towards for starters. And one thing that I we see a lot is even though you may have the data that backs up what you're trying to to maybe make changes within the organization because you see some things that are that are proving out in the data that, like you all have said, that anecdotally you may see one thing, but there needs to be changes. Helping with change management 
with within your organization to really help people that are a little bit resistant to change have good conversations with them make sure you're involving them early and often to to have those conversations early so you, they know that um, there's a real true reason for the change and get their buy-in early the better you, you do getting buy-in instead of just pushing through a change the better it's going to be for the organization overall um, one example i'll give is and it's kind of on the fundraising side is we have several clients that they'll have an mgo that a that major gift officer that will have the same person inside of their database or their portfolio for years they meet with them regularly they have coffee with them often but that person's not increasing their giving or they're not really giving much at all let's get that person we, we get, we've shown them data that says that person doesn't really have the capacity you thought they did but they don't let's get that person moved out let's get somebody else moved in sometimes that's really hard but coming to them and having a conversation about this is what we're trying to do and this is why we're trying to do it early so they get their get their true buy-in before you utilize that data to really show why you're going to make changes that can be on the program side as well obviously if you if you see some changes that need to be made a lot of people inside organizations that run programs they've been doing it for as brian said it a number of times this is the way we've always done it why would we change get the buy-in early from individuals be based on data and based on good information then to make those changes that you're looking for in the future Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. All right, Stephanie, over to you. Thoughts on key considerations for nonprofits aiming to foster a culture of data-driven decision-making. Yeah, I spent some time with these questions ahead of time and <laughs> just something about key considerations. I started making a list and it it's, I started with, it was like, there's a lot of key considerations, I think. But um, so I narrowed it down to three things that I'll speak to in terms of key considerations, either because I thought they were maybe the most important of the key considerations or just one that I found maybe personally interesting. Uh, so one that I think is really important that we haven't, I don't think touched on too much yet today is the idea of leadership commitment uh, to this idea of data-driven decision-making. Uh, the leadership team must be committed to the idea of data-driven decision-making. Uh, leadership sets the tone by valuing data, by incorporating it into their own decisions, and by consistently expecting the same throughout the organization. Uh, individual contributors will value data if they see it modeled from a leadership level, and I have seen where that is a little bit upside down and it does not work as well. Uh, number two, data collection and management. We've talked more or less quite a lot about this, but that's what we're here for. Um, it, 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 but uh, here, thinking specifically about the, the, the fact that you have to have the right systems in place to collect, store, and manage data effectively. Uh, ideally, I think that means creating one source of truth. If your donation data, marketing data, and service data are all in different systems or spreadsheets spread around, you are missing insights. Uh, Redpath, as I, I think we mentioned at the beginning, we work with nonprofits who use salesforce.com. So that's an option um, that is an enterprise quality CRM data, database that is used by top shelf businesses around the world, but which also offers free user licenses to nonprofits. Uh, but whatever system you choose, there needs to be some, there probably needs to be some kind of upfront investment in implementing a holistic data management system for your org. Uh, keeping in mind that you can tell uh, a compelling story about how investing in data will drive your mission, and you might be able to find funders who are interested in partnering with you to, to do that kind of project. Uh, oh, number three, um, experimentation and learning. So this is um, sort of a passion area for me. Um, encourage a culture of experimentation when it comes to looking at your data. Um, uh, what I was resonating with earlier with Jennifer about challenging assumptions um, and, and using data to do that. Uh, being open to trying new approaches and learning from both successes and failures. It's not just about finding your success in your data. Um, with my clients, I like to model an attitude of positivity and excitement when we find bad or scary things in their data. Uh, for example, when I help clients organize and get insight to their data, it's not uncommon that we might discover that they have 10,000 duplicate contacts on their list or that they have big donors who haven't been reached out to in over a year. Uh, this might be distressing to learn, <laughs> um, but I like to point out that the discovering these issues is awesome because they were there before. <laughs> you just didn't know it. Um, uh, but they were there, they were affecting you in invisible, negative ways. Uh, seeing our data clearly allows us to then take positive action. 
um, modeling that attitude wherever you're at in your organization um, empowers people to know that any insight is better than no insight. That's wonderful, Stephanie. Thank you. Jennifer, you're up next. What are some key considerations when aiming to foster a culture of data-driven decision-making and continuous improvement? So I think when both Stephanie and Tim touched on this, but definitely making sure that everyone knows it's everybody's responsibility and training your staff on how to collect data. I think sometimes, you know, we joke about in the nonprofit sector that we all wear many hats and kind of when you when you're faced with taking on a new responsibility, um, it can seem a little bit daunting. It's not exactly the like, most exciting activity that you could be doing, but making sure that, you know, it's everyone's responsibility. Totally get that staff buy-in and make sure that your staff are trained and that they feel confident and competent to use the systems in place that are collecting that data. Because I think a lot of times we see this in nonprofits is there'll be like one champion in an organization for data and then they leave. And the rest of the organization is kind of scrambling to try to, to figure out, okay, well, how do we collect that data? Like, how do we keep moving forward? And so definitely, if every if it's everyone's responsibility, then you don't have to worry about those turnover situations. And you can make sure that you're consistently collecting that data. Another thing that I think is a key consideration for nonprofits is putting the processes in place. Um, like I said, wearing a lot of hats, your, or your bandwidth is already so thin. And as much as you possibly can, whether it's from using Salesforce or using something like a campaign monitor or a Hootsuite that pulls those analytics for you, making those processes as automatic as possible. So that way, all you have to do is pull the report and begin to analyze it, I think makes looking at the data a little bit easier and less time consuming and also seem less daunting uh, from a nonprofit like employee perspective. And then lastly, and I think this is an, another crucial thing, is sharing that data with your organization, with your team. It's great that now, you know, everyone has staff buy-in about this data, that you have the processes in place. But if you're not sharing that data, then you're keeping those key insights to yourself and potentially prohibiting your team or even leadership from really making the best course of action going forward. So you want to make sure whether it's, you know, at a weekly team meeting or a I mean, at the very least at a quarterly board meeting situation, presenting and sharing the key insights from that data. So that way everyone is prepared um, with all of the information going forward to actually drive that decision-making process properly. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, Brian, any additional thoughts on key considerations when aiming to foster a culture of data-driven decision-making? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stay uh, I'm going to keep going where Jennifer and 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 Stephanie went at the end. Um yeah, with regards to that data and or where Stephanie maybe went at the beginning, data has to be accessible. It has to be accessible to everybody whether you're making it accessible through dashboards that make it understandable for people, accessible for people. Um I know that I've been guilty of this in the past where I'll start talking about data in a way that I understand it, but then my understanding comes from 35 years of looking at this data and understanding it in a certain way. And I realize, wait a second, you know, the value, as Jennifer points out, in everybody appreciating it before we all move on uh, can't, be, can't be overstated. Um, if I'm expecting the person doing the data entry to fully understand why I want all of these things done and checked and why we build systems that, you know, spit out little error reports so that we can fix things. If I want them to buy into the whole process, they have to understand why we're collecting the data and ultimately later how we're using it. Otherwise, it just feels like more work for them. And, and we're presenting them with more work and they just think we're nitpicking or what have you, you know? So, um, when we say, no, 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 the reason we want all this detail is this is how we use the employment data. You know, we actually collect matching gifts off the employment data. But if the person who's entering the data never understands that we have a matching gift program and how that works, then they just think that we're making it harder for them to enter a gift, you know, or we're making it harder for them to do something they used to do because they only had to enter six fields of data. And now we're asking them to enter 10 fields of data. Um, so making everybody appreciate you know, front to back, 
um, how the data is used is important. And I'll also speak to what Jennifer was saying, leadership. Yeah, buy-in, critically important. Then the leaders have to demonstrate that their decision-making is data-driven. And then the final thing that they can do for everyone at the organization is celebrate the successes and particularly highlight the ones that came about because of data-driven decision-making, right? I mean, you know, we've got the KPIs, we've got the way to measure things, we've begun to measure things. If we don't celebrate success, then again, it's still, it's still, we're still rats on a wheel, working, 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 and nobody's telling us we're succeeding. That's no fun. Um, and work is work, you know, but in the end, if it isn't fun, people will find somewhere else to go. And that's a new reality in the last two or three years is none of the nonprofits I'm working with feel they can maintain all the quality people they need. So um, we need to make work fun again for people who aren't enjoying themselves. Thanks, Brian. All right, we're officially opening our Q&A portion. And Jen, I'll have you start us off with this question. This is from Maddie. She said, these are all exciting suggestions. Any tips to get buy-in from colleagues who may feel too overworked to dive into data insights with our DBA? I think one of the biggest things where we spell success in bringing other staff members into the data collection process is having them see the impact of what their like actual job was through the data. So maybe on the program side, for instance, um, we had um, like counselors, case managers who would meet with veterans. And I feel like, you know, day in and day out, it seemed like they were just taking a lot of phone calls. But then when we were able to sit down with them and show, okay, well, for every phone call that you're having, this is on average the number of like people in their household, their family members who you're having an impact on. And then we were able to correlate that number to like a financial like uh, improvement that they received. So by helping this one person, you're essentially helping the four other people living in their household and you're providing them a value of X number of dollars every time you hop on a phone call with them and showing that relationship had them buying into understanding, okay, this is why it's so important to collect this data, to log this data accurately. And that way, when it came time to reporting out those numbers, whether it was to grantors or for a fundraising campaign, they were much more excited to like sit down and see the quarterly impact, sometimes even more than we were, um, just because they were excited to see the true impact of what their work was having on the community. So I definitely think making those relationships as strong as possible will help get staff buy-in for sure. And then also a great default <laughs> is generally speaking, you know, the more numbers and data that you can have around the impact that you're having, uh, typically, I say that, fingers crossed, uh, typically it relates to better stories and numbers that you can provide in grant applications, which will hopefully result in more money, which means more re resources at the end of the day for your nonprofit. And one thing that I think will motivate a lot of team members is the prospect of maybe a new platform or even a new team member that's able to help out in some of those problematic areas. So always, always a good incentive. Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else want to add to that? If I could really quick, um, something, so she was asking about, uh, you know, asking people who are already busy with so many things on their plate to sit down with the database person and dig into data together. Like, where does that fit into your your day-to-day -day job? Um, and what I want to raise is this idea is that it's uh, it's it rarely works well, I think, for it to be a one-way street of, um, people saying, well, here's what I need from my data database person, clearly defined X, Y, Z, now you give it to me. Um, that's maybe not how you're wired if you are a program delivery person or even, I mean, any any kind of role. Um, we're, we're all doing different things and, th and thinking in different ways. Your database person, okay, here's, I, I see it as more of a circle um, where, uh, so encouraging your database people, encourage, it's, I've also seen database people who are just sitting there just waiting for that directive that doesn't come because there's someone sitting over here saying, I'm just a program delivery person, or I'm just a fundraising, you know, relationship person. And the database person sitting over here saying, well, I have 
data. I think I'm doing a pretty good job with it, but like you're not using it. And I don't know, you know, um, so maybe it takes a little bit of initiative on both sides. I like to see that initiative start on the side of the database person to say, well, I don't, I maybe am not in the seat to like dictate what you need to see, but I can show you some of the things that I see in the data. So We'll pull some reports, put it into some pie charts, make some bar graphs. It literally doesn't matter what they look like at first. It's just kind of maybe whatever that first person has to show in the data, because then you can start to have this iterative conversation. So now you're not just demanding someone to step out of their role and think of something. You can say, I have something to show you. Look at my pie chart, look at my bar graph. And they might say, oh, that's cute. Well, but you know what would be actually really useful to me? Could you make a bar chart that does this? And like all of a sudden that sparks the conversation. So it's not just one person's job to define it and then you build it. it it's this circular conversation where you participate together. Wonderful. All right. And believably, the hour is going by so quickly. So we're going to wrap up this portion of the panel so we can stick to our schedule. So sorry if we haven't addressed your question or if you have any more questions for panelists, please complete the survey that will be dropped in the chat to indicate which panelists you have questions for and we'll make sure to connect you with them after the session. I've had such a wonderful time hearing from our panelists today and I'm hoping to get one final piece of insight from them all in this speed round. And Stephanie, I'll have you start us off with this one. What do you see as the future for nonprofits and how can they get ahead today? Um, what I think every business has learned in the past three years is the importance of adapting to change. Uh, the pandemic supercharged that rate of change for, for many of us, but I think the overall reality of a changing world is here to stay, especially in terms of how technology fits into our lives and what it means to stay ahead of the technology curve. Um, data and technology really go hand in hand. So today's focus on data can't be separated from that topic of technology. Um, as I mentioned earlier, data insight powered by technology tools allows your organization to pivot and adjust when it needs to. So I think in, in this quickly changing world, that ability to harness technology is what separates nonprofits that are getting ahead from those that will be left behind. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, Brian, thoughts on the future and how to get ahead today? Yeah, I'd make, I'd make, I'd, I'd lean in as well to the technology aspect of it, but I would, uh, with one proviso, um, uh, I would say that we use the technology to make ourselves more efficient. We use the technology to give us deeper understanding. And then we have to think very carefully about how we put our personality and the human factor back on top of the actual connection and the experience. In fundraising, we know that people give to people right? Um, but the organizations, uh, you know, uh, all of us know that the organizations that raise the most money are doing deep research, identifying the best prospects, you know, and all of that. But in the end, it's people giving to people. Yes, the technology helps us know which people we should be talking to, perhaps when and for how much. Um, but again, it's the personal contact in the end and the personal stories about the personal impacts that that will drive the actual giving. Um, so we use the technology, but again, we have to put the human layer on it. And I think that's the other thing we've learned from the pandemic was we all came out of that, that horrible period of, of isolation, realizing we want to be closer together than ever before. Um, but how to do that, right? I mean, how to do that well, um, I think is, is going to be something that we're looking at going forward. So harnessing the technology, but then reminding people that, that we're people and, and the work we're doing is about helping people. Thanks, Brian. Jennifer, over to you. Thoughts on the future and how to get ahead today? I definitely think the future for nonprofits is very exciting. I think they're maybe on the forefront of a lot of trends that we're going to see, maybe more so than other industries. And in particular, especially around this conversation of data and testimonials, with the rise of Gen Z and their need for authenticity, I think the hand in hand of providing hard data along with those testimonial human impact stories is gonna be so pivotal in the nonprofit space going forward over the next like 10, 15 years as Gen Z starts to develop and become more and more activated. So definitely gonna be something to keep your eyes on. Thanks, Jennifer. Tim, over to you, thoughts on the future and how to get ahead today. Sure. Um, as I said earlier, I was at a conference earlier this week and they were discussing AI and how to utilize that in not-for-profits because 
as they they did some research, the person who was talking had showed that about 60% of for-profit organizations in the last year are fully utilizing AI in their day-to-day -day operations. And only 25% of not-for-profits work is always, not-for-profits always seem to lag a little behind the for-profits as far as um, utilizing technology and that thing. So making sure that we're, we're really utilizing that. But the one, the couple of caveats that we had with that, that as we had the discussion in the group is, let's make sure that um, we're not making fundraising and, and the work not-for-profits are doing more transactional. It needs to still be, as Brian just alluded to, we still have to have that human element. Use it as what it is. And this is the second point. It's a tool. AI and this new technology, all this, it's just a tool to be able to really utilize what you can, what you have in your organization to really help, you know, whatever your organization's there for, to really drive that impact and uh, and utilize those tools, though. Make sure we're not shying away from it because it's new and scary and those kind of things. Make sure we're, we're really embracing it as well. Thanks, Tim. All right. And with that, we have reached the Adverb panel. I want to give a big thank you to our panelists for sharing their insights today. I also want to give a big thank you to our audience. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope you enjoyed yourself and learned something that will benefit the work that you do on a daily basis. Please keep an eye out on the NX Unite website and on, and on our LinkedIn page to make sure that you don't miss out on future panels. All right, that is it for me once again. Thank you all for joining us and have a nice rest of your day. Bye, everyone.